So good afternoon, everybody. It is such an honor to be here um, to share with you some of our research findings um, that really change our way about how we can treat Alzheimer's disease. So first, I will try to get back to uh, my first slide. Before I um, share with you our exciting results, let me just first say um, that Alzheimer's really today poses the gravest problem in our society. So as Congressman Cohen alluded to earlier, life expectancy is increasing with medical and socioeconomical advances. And baby boom generation is reaching 65 and older, ages when the risk for Alzheimer's disease and other dementia um, is elevated. So today, um, there are 5.5 million uh, Americans afflicted by um, Alzheimer's disease. And this figure is going to rise to 8.4 million by 2030 and 13.8 million by 2050. And every state is going to see an increase in the number of people affected by Alzheimer's disease, with some states seeing more than 30% increases. And these increases are going to have a huge effect on each state's healthcare systems and Medicaid, for sure. In 2017, Alzheimer's disease and other dementias is costing the nation $259 billion. And this cost can go as high as $1.1 trillion by 2050. But another $230 billion is in economic value is associated with caregiving for others with Alzheimer's. Today, more than 15 million Americans are providing unpaid care for people with Alzheimer's. And this is really a very, very severe problem, not just for the US, but globally. So without efficient treatment, Alzheimer's disease looms as the most severe problem facing our nation. So in current effort to treat the disease, our options are very limited. Only four drugs have been approved, some more than 20 years ago, but then little progress has followed. And none of these drugs can really reverse the disease, but only provide some relief of symptoms for a short period of time. And this is not without intense effort in the drug industry to come up with better a more efficient treatment. Here is an astonishing figure. 99.6% of all clinical trials for Alzheimer's disease fail. The main approach to treating Alzheimer's disease is to target specific genes and molecules. And over the last three decades, we have come a long way in learning the genes and molecules that contributed to the disease. Yet, these types of approaches have not worked. For example, the amyloid hypothesis you might have heard about has been dominant in the field for several decades. So this sticky uh, plaques that you commonly see in the brain of Alzheimer's patients, they are made up of um, small amyloid peptides. These peptides accumulate in the brain of the patients and are considered the culprit of the disease. Today, all the drugs that are designed to target this amyloid, either to reduce its total amount or to interfere with its production have all failed. And what we now know about the buildup of the amyloid in the brain is that it actually starts two decades before 
other pathological symptoms appear before memory loss and dementia, amyloid is already building up. So brain structure changes as cells die, and brain function slowly deteriorates until medical help is sought. So what we really need to understand is what happens in the brain over these two decades. But our brain is a very complex structure. It's not just genes and molecules or just even cells. Our brain has billions of neurons, these brain cells, and other supporting cell types. And these neurons make trillions of these little synapses with each other. So these are connections between these neurons to form these highly intricate brain circuits or networks, much like a computer, but more powerful. And this is the reason why my research team takes a new approach. We look at the brain as a whole system, and Alzheimer's disease as a systems level failure. So I work together with engineers, um, computer scientists, physicians, and systems neuroscientists. And together, we took the opportunity to look more closely at the changes in the brain's connectivity and how it relates to the development of Alzheimer's disease, pathology, and symptoms. Here is a fascinating property of our brain. That, that large group of connected neurons can fire together synchronously to produce these so-called um, rhythmic oscillations or brain waves. Some, part, some people may have heard of it. And many different frequencies. So fascinating um, in its nature, these different frequencies of rhythms or brain waves are actually highly evolutionarily conserved. You see these different frequencies of brain waves in small mammals such as bat and mouse and in primates, including humans. And these different frequencies can become stronger at times depending on the function and activity of our brain. And I want to specifically talk about the gamma rhythms. So these gamma rhythms are known to um, oscillate uh, between 30 to 80 hertz range, so meaning cycles per second. And the gamma rhythms are particularly involved in higher order brain functions, functions like working memory, sensory processing, and spatial navigation. But most importantly, gamma rhythms are impaired in Alzheimer's disease. So there are quite a few studies um, reported this impairment. For example, in the transgenic mouse model, researchers found that the synaptic activity of a particular group of neurons known as the inhibitory neurons or known as the fast spiking PV positive neurons is disrupted. So the disruption of the synaptic activity of this group of neurons leads to weakened gamma rhythms, specifically around 40 hertz frequency band. And the disrupted gamma rhythms, in turn, is linked to impaired cognitive function, um, such as learning and memory. Most importantly, in humans, MEG recordings also show that gamma rhythms around 40 hertz frequency band is significantly, significantly reduced in subjects with Alzheimer's disease compared to age-matched healthy control. So we were very intrigued by these reports. And our question was, how early are these gamma rhythms affected in the course of the disease? And further, 
if gamma is in, indeed affected, is it causal to the disease? So before I share with you some of our data, let me tell you a little bit more about other pathological features of Alzheimer's. So in addition to these sticky plaques or amyloid plaques and dementia memory impairment, Alzheimer's brain also show very abundant so-called neurofibrillary tau tangles. So um, these tangles are made up of this abnormally modified and aggregated tau protein. In addition, Alzheimer's brain is smaller. It's smaller because large numbers of brain cells die during the disease. In addition, the synaptic connections that I told you about, very important for the communications between these neurons, is also reduced. Their brain also show very severe neural inflammation. Okay, so there are many, many different things going on in these brains of Alzheimer's disease. So we first wanted to determine how early is gamma rhythm disrupted in the course of the disease. So we started off with a well-established mouse model of Alzheimer's disease. This model, you can see, developed very abundant, this amyloid sticky plaques in their brain. And they started to show memory loss um, by six months of age, okay? So we decided to evaluate three months old animals. So this is way before the onset of memory impairments. And also, we want to specifically look into a particular brain structure known as the hippocampus. Because hippocampus is known to be the center for learning and memory formation. And you can see that in the three months old animals, there is hardly any uh, amyloid plaques in the structure, in this particular structure. So, um, so how do we um, measure uh, gamma rhythms in the brain? So this is a cute experiment you might like. We um, train this um, Alzheimer's model mouse to run on an air-supported ball. It's almost like a treadmill through a virtual reality maze. And then we surgically implanted an electrode into their hippocampus so we can record gamma rhythms when they're running. And we also can record gamma rhythms when they hit a wall and try to figure out what to do next. Okay. So, um, so I would just really uh, summarize um, the data from a large number of um, experiments. To cut a long story short, very early on in the course of the disease, before cognitive impairment, gamma rhythms in this Alzheimer's model mouse is already impaired. So this compromised gamma rhythm in such an early stage suggests to us that it may contribute to the development of the other pathology and symptoms of the disease. So we then ask, what will happen if we could bring gamma rhythms back to the brain of these animals. So how do we do that? It turned out that it is possible to induce brain rhythms by stimulating the senses. In the 90s, researchers um, found that by shining a light to cat with specific frequency patterns, the neurons in the part of the brain that's responsible for processing vision can produce the brain rhythms at the exact same frequency. So we were fascinated by these observations. So we wanted to know whether this also works in mice. So I collaborated with um, Emery Brown and Ed Boyden at MIT, and together, we created a LED light box where we can house the mice. And then we can also control 
the flickering of the light at different frequency through an Arduino motherboard. And what we found is that if we shine the light to the animals at the 40 hertz gamma frequency, then we detect a very robust gamma rhythms in their brain, as if their impaired gamma rhythms is restored. So this was exciting. So we wanted to know what happens to these animals. So in the work that is currently ongoing in my laboratory, we found that these mice with impaired learning and memory, they can learn again. Their memory is restored on a wide range of behavior tasks. They can remember an object in an environment, they can remember a place, and they can navigate better. Most importantly, we found that this improvement in their behavior is rooted in changes that are happening in their brain. First of all, we found that the amyloid that was building up in the brain of the Alzheimer's mouse and humans is drastically reduced. So in a um, publication in Nature in December last year, we show that with as little as one hour of light flicker exposure per day for a total of seven days, the sticky amyloid plaques in the brain they are drastically reduced in both the number and the size. And we actually tested out a number of different flickering conditions. Okay? So here I'm showing you some quantification data. So bear with me, because I'm really proud of this um, piece of result. Um, so on the y-axis here, we are looking at the amyloid levels. And here we are showing the different treatment conditions. And the first column here represented animals kept in constant dark, so they serve as control. And then the second column represents animals kept in constant room light. And the third column were animals exposed to one hour of 40 hertz light flicker. And I think you can appreciate that was enough to, to cut amyloid by half, okay? And lower, uh, slower frequency, such as 20 hertz flicker, or higher frequency, such as 80 hertz flicker, don't work. And also, if we flicker the light at the random frequency, it doesn't reduce amyloid either. So the amyloid reduction activity is very specific to the 40 hertz gamma flicker stimulation. So with these results, we were excited, but we were also very anxious, you know? I mean, with such unbelievable and expected results, um, I don't know how to explain it. Um, we just had this kind of anxiety to want to repeat it as many times as possible, to get as many different people to repeat it. Um, but as a basic researcher, we know that if we actually understand how is amyloid reduced, we'll feel much better. And we will believe this data more. So, um, so, so we wanted to figure out why is amyloid so drastically reduced by this non-invasive treatment. So just to summarize what we found, we found that the production of the amyloid, which is normally released by neurons, is significantly reduced following gamma flicker stimulation. So I think this is very exciting. But we also saw something else that's spectacular, which is the impact on other cell types. In this case, microglia. So I don't know how much you heard about microglia. They are brain's innate immune cells. And they function like janitors or, or scavengers normally surveying the brain environment 
and um, remove foreign substances such as bacteria and viruses or toxic waste like amyloid from the brain to keep the brain cells happy. But in Alzheimer's disease, these microglia are completely silent. It's as if they are on strike, okay? They're just sitting there doing nothing. However, after the 40 hertz gamma flicker stimulation, I just want to show you some primary data here because you can see with your own eyes how different this microglia look now. They become larger in size, their branches are more complex, and there are just more of them all together. But more importantly, with the gamma flicker stimulation, these microglia are active again. They are very busy gobbling up this amyloid. So we realize why this flicker treatment is so effective. Because it not only reduces amyloid production, but it also facilitates the clearance of amyloid. It turned out that it's even better than that. So in ongoing work in my lab, we found that other cells also respond to the gamma flicker stimulation. So the blood vessels, also known as the vasculature, they are extremely abundant in the brain. If you stretch them out from our brain, it will go for four miles or longer. And these blood vessels are very important in providing nutrients to the brain and also remove toxic waste. And we found, following gamma flicker stimulation, this blood vessel that is the, the lumen is dilated, larger. In fact, significantly larger by about 100%. So I think this dilation of the blood vessel also contributes to the removal of the amyloid. And we also um, started to look at other mouse models of neurodegeneration. One of the models has this neurofibrillary tau tangle pathology. So this tau protein is very important in our brain cell, in neurons. They normally maintain the stability of our nerve fibers because they stabilize the cytoskeletal components of the cells. But in Alzheimer's disease, this tau protein is abnormally modified. They detach from the cytoskeleton, and they start to aggregate and form this filamentous structure known as the neurofibrillary tangles. And the nerve structure also collapses. It's, it's a very bad um, situation. So in this tau tangle model, again, we expose the mice uh, for one hour of light flicker per day for a total of seven days. So here, you can appreciate the tau, aggregated tau protein is this bright green uh, material surrounding the, 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 the brain cells. But after the light flicker stimulation, they disappeared. Okay? So the flicker also attenuates the tango pathology. Finally, how about neurodegeneration itself? I told you that in the Alzheimer's brain, large number of neurons die and the brain becomes smaller. So, um, so we expose the mice, in this case, to the gamma flicker for a prolonged period of time, six to eight weeks. And we found it protected the brain cells from dying. It prevented the brain from shrinking. And the synaptic connections, the density is restored, okay? So these results, again, is just unbelievable. But it doesn't stop here. I'll show you something that, you know, I, it makes me speechless. So I told you earlier that um, the light flicker is delivered through our vision, right? So the gamma rhythms initially um, was detected in the part of the brain responsible for processing the vision. So this part of the brain is known as the visual cortex. And the visual cortex 
V1, label V1 there, is normally situated in the back of the brain, both in rodents and in humans. It's in the back. Okay. So initially, all our analysis was focusing on the visual cortex, and we saw all these beneficial effects, and, and very nice, and, and so on. But we totally didn't expect, when we look at other parts of the brain, that these beneficial effects actually spread from the visual cortex all the way to the rest of the brain, including the hippocampus, the memory center and the prefrontal cortex, the part of the brain known to be important for making decisions and performing executive functions. So, what are we doing now? What can be better? <laughs> so, we are now looking to see whether we can induce brain reasons by stimul stimulating other sensory modalities, um, such as sound, or smell, or touch. We want to know whether some senses may work better than the others, and whether a combination of senses will work even better. So I want to remind you that uh, what's new and key to our approach is that we are not targeting a single gene product or molecule. By inducing gamma rhythms in the brain, we are seeing systemic and broad effect on many different cell types to affect many different processes. And the key part seems to involve um, an, an enabling the brain's intrinsic repair capacity. And because our approach is so non-invasive, many people have immediately asked whether we can apply this treatment to human subjects. So indeed, if humans react similarly to what we have seen in animal models, then our approach can be life-changing for millions of families. So while my laboratory continues with our fundamental research, to address important questions. Um, we have also just spun up a startup company that is looking at uh, the feasibility of bringing the treatment to human subjects with funding from venture capital. So our published work and unpublished work um, that I just shared with you today, as well as the foundational work it was based upon was supported by the NIH. It was the sustained support um, um, from many, many NIH grants, as well as the indirect costs to my university, MIT, over the decade that lead to this breakthrough. It took multidisciplinary effort to bring the work to life. I collaborated with many colleagues from different disciplines. Particularly, I would like to point out that Emery Brown, who is a physician scientist and a statistician, and um, Ed Boyden, who is an electrical engineer and a computer scientist. And they both play a very important part in the work that I described to you today. And um, their NIH support was also pivotal um, to supporting this research over the years. And in fact, I want to share with you that I first worked on gamma rhythms almost 10 years ago. Um, back then, I used this, um, you know, back then the breakthrough technology, um, optogenetics, to induce gamma rhythms, for the first time to induce gamma rhythms in the brain by driving those um, fast biking interneurons. And the work was published back in 2009. And at the time, I just really wanted to understand the brain rhythms. Um, I want to figure out how it worked and what the function is in the brain. And, and back then, I definitely didn't imagine, didn't dream that one day I will be able to affect Alzheimer's disease <coughs> using gamma rhythms. And 
you know, optogenetics, as I said, allowed us to control the activity of brain cells um, using lasers. But it involves um, infecting the cells that we want to control with viruses and surgical implantation of fiber optics. So 10 years ago, optogenetics gave us unprecedented control of brain activity, but it didn't have high translational potential because it is so invasive. And rigorous fundamental research and sustained NIH support brought us from using optogenetics to developing this completely non-invasive approach to um, induce brain rhythms. So while our approach has very high potential to affect Alzheimer's disease, I think it is very important to continue with our fundamental research to advance our findings. So in parallel with our startup company um, towards human testing, I want to go back to my laboratory to, to use animal models to address some of these very, very important questions that I alluded to earlier, like you know, the stimulating other senses also provide beneficial effect. And you know, I'm so excited, I want to share with you preliminary data show that the auditory um, gamma stimulation also works very well. So right now we are testing the combination of auditory and visual stimulation. And we wanted to know, you know, whether we really have to apply one hour per day every day or we can get away with shorter treatment time or do we need to do treatment every day. Um, and very importantly, we want to know how this treatment will interact with um, the current med um, uh, medication for Alzheimer's because almost all the patients are on some kind of medication, one way or another, even though they really don't work, but the doctors prescribe nonetheless because there is nothing else out there. So we need to know whether this drug is going to interfere with our treatment or not, or not. So they are all very important fundamental questions that we need to address. So finally, I want to end my talk with this slide. In order to have groundbreaking discoveries and to fight the most pervasive diseases that devastate our society, it is more important than ever to have sustained long-term funding, including indirect costs from the NIH, and to have support for multidisciplinary collaborations, and to have an open mind to path-breaking high-risk research. So I would like to end my talk here, and I thank you very much for your question.